Hey guys, how you doing? Uncle Steph here. So, I'm recording this just before New Year's 2024, so 2025. What is the programming language of the future? From my perspective, uh, given my decade of experience in the game, so I got seven bullet points very quickly. And actually, some of the languages that are out there now already satisfy these requirements, at least many of them. So the first thing I want is memory-safe languages. I don't want to be managing memory because it's a lot of work. It leaves a lot of opportunity for bugs, and it leaves potential vulnerabilities in terms of uh, vectors of attack on software. That's why recently the uh, federal government in the U.S. has uh, strongly suggested that people writing software for government uh, applications move to memory-safe languages like uh, Python and Swift and so on, Rust. So I'm a big believer in that as well. Memory safety is huge. Of course, I grew up on memory-safe languages. Java was one of the first languages I learned in 95. Number two, I like flexible typing. So uh, sometimes... Um, loosely typed languages make sense when you're writing small, nimble apps, little scripts and so on. You don't want to have to deal with types. Uh, and when you, as the project becomes more and more complex, you want more and more uh, control over the typing. So strongly typed languages come in as well. And then there's some hybrid uh, expressions of that as well in certain languages. So flexible typing is my number two. Number three quality that I like in a modern programming language, my ideal language, is you want something that's terse. You want a language that's very expressive. Few lines of code, a little bit of code gets a lot done, like a Python, like a JavaScript, like a PHP. Uh, Java, not so much. C Sharp, although they're getting better, not as much. Uh, I used to do a lot of Java code back in the day, but I stopped using it because it's just too... Uh, verbose. It's just too long-winded, not just in terms of the syntax, but just in terms of configurations and so on. Yeah, I want a nice, terse, precise, highly expressive language. Right time speed, time it takes you to get something done, is very important to me. It's actually more important to me than run time speed, since processors and memory are becoming cheaper and cheaper. So, uh, with some exceptions, maybe you're building a gaming engine, then you want the fastest running uh, application you can possibly have, but for most business applications, right time speed is far more important than run time speed. Quality number four, I want a language that has OOP, object-oriented uh, layer in there. I also want some procedural and functional capability as well. Why? Again, it's that flexibility. Object-oriented programming is fantastic when you have very complex systems, larger systems, systems that have a lot of moving parts and components, OO. P is super useful there. On the other hand, if you're just writing some simple scripts, something, you know, 500 lines of code, something like that, then OOP is just too too much overkill. That's where uh, functional programming or procedural programming become much, much more uh, interesting to me. So you have languages that do all three now, and so, uh, or at least two. So that's very cool, you know. You can't be a zealot and say, I just like OOP, or I just like functional program, or I just like, nobody likes procedural. But it's useful. Sometimes you're write, just writing some quips, quick scripts. Uh, procedural coding is uh, more, than, uh, more than good enough, that's for sure. Procedural becomes an issue when you're starting to use procedural coding methodologies in a larger application where you have all kinds of things going on. Then you're going to get into all kinds of problems. The fifth quality of a modern language, my favorite language for 2025, the language of the future, would be a large ecosystem. You want a large ecosystem that you can leverage. For example, Python is a great example of that. Python's strength really is its huge ecosystem. You got packages and libraries, uh, what they call modules in Python. You, could do almost, you, can, you got a modules where you can order pizza. So uh, large ecosystems are fantastic. Uh, for example, Java, in .NET, the power of Java is the JVM, not so much the language itself. If I'm going to, when I look at Java, I look at that super powerful Java virtual machine. That's, you know, that's part of the ecosystem anyway. But you have a huge, massive power in the JVM. That's what I, I care about. I would use Kotlin to access the JVM rather than Java, again, because Java doesn't sa satisfy my uh, need for very a terse language. But anyway, large ecosystem is huge. It goes beyond 
the core language, everything around it. Python is like one of my best examples of that. The last two qualities that I look for in programming languages is not something you hear talked about enough. Number one, the language should be easy to learn. You want to be able to onboard people as quickly as possible. So Rust satisfies uh, several, of these several of these qualities, except it's not easy to learn. So adoption is much slower. So you may be looking at this from the point of view of a developer. Well, that's good. Is it hard to learn is good. It protects the jobs. Mm, yes and no. I think uh, you have to always look at things from the point of view of the employer. You know, if, if it's hard for a company to train people up in a particular technology, they're less likely to want to adopt it because it's harder to train people up. So easy to learn is my sixth property. And my seventh and last property that I look for in a modern language, my uh, programming language of the future, is that it should be easy to install and configure. One of the biggest problems I have or had with Java is that it's a pain in the butt to install. You know, you got to you got to install the was it the Java runtime, and then you got to set up class paths and all kinds of stuff. Maybe they've improved upon that, but it's a pain in the butt. Whereas Python, you just one click install, boom, it's done. You know, a PHP one click install, boom, it's done. This is Ruby one click install, it's done. You don't have to start configuring class paths and all kinds of crap. The configuration nightmare. In the Java world, it uh, goes beyond just the local install, also just in terms of configuring app servers and stuff. Yes, it's much easier than it used to be, but with PHP, it's nothing. you got a PHP INI file, you go click, click, click what you want, and that's it, it's done. It's, uh, it's far more complex, unfortunately. That's why Java is moving into the new uh, COBOL. Don't get me wrong, there's plenty of Java jobs, and a lot of people like writing Java, Java code, and the JVM is super powerful but it doesn't satisfy my ideal qualities. Today we have examples of several languages that satisfy some, or if not all, of these properties. you got Swift, Python, and there are others. Um, so that's me. That's my ideal based on my decades of experience. Let me know what you think. If you disagree, give me examples of language, languages you kind of like. That being said, there are times when you have to use a language that's not memory safe, like a C++ for the speed for a gaming engine. You know, there's sometimes when you have to use uh, certain types of languages or certain technologies given a job, like Swift, you know, it doesn't have a huge ecosystem. It's more or less for building iOS apps and macOS apps. But, you know, if you're going to be doing that and you need high performance and maximum capability within the iOS ecosystem or within an iOS device, then you, you want to go Swift. My first choice, by the way, if I'm building mobile apps, is to look for a cross-platform solution, whether it be a PWA or a Flutter or React Native or something. That's my first instinct. But sometimes you have to go native. All right, I hope you found this video useful. I'm Uncle Steph. I mentor people in the ways of software development. I've been doing this since 1994 professionally, and I have a mentoring program at UncleSteph.com, also standalone courses. And I'm coming up with a whole new program on business mentoring and entrepreneurship and so on. It's a separate program, so it's a different focus. And that's coming out pretty soon. I'm pretty excited about it. And uh, there you go. If you like this video, give me a thumbs up. If you don't like my video, give me two thumbs down. If you like my hat, give me a thumbs up. Um, if you're asking about where I got my hoodie, I have no idea. I bought three copies at some place a year or so ago, I forget where, but I'll, I'll keep track of my clothing purchases going forward because people ask me all the time. Anyway, that's it. If you're curious about anything else, I got a book on beginner web design down below. Uh, well, it's beginner coding, really. Uh, I wrote that 800 years ago, but it's still 100% viable today because the technology has not changed. That's it.